Good Vibrations. Welcome back to another episode of Good Vibrations, and I'm here with a guest who has previously appeared on a few occasions, and we're here for an updated chat on the McCartney conspiracy, but I don't use the phrase PID, Paul is dead, anymore, because it does tend to carry a fair bit of baggage with it, and my guest today knows all about that only too well, so welcome back to Mike Williams, aka Sage of Quay. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mark. Thank you for having me back. Good to have you back on. Now, for anyone that might be groaning, thinking, oh, God, another McCartney conversation retreading old ground, our intention here today is to go into some different areas of all of this that you don't normally hear discussed. Nobody needs another show just going back over the same old tired narratives that have been trotted out a million times. We are going to talk about the updated version of the memoirs of Billy Shears, because there's some stuff in it which I think is very key to getting to the bottom of all this and trying to discern the truth. But we're going to some other areas as well. And I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, that this whole subject area has actually become as divisive as flat earth. It pits friend against friend, brother against brother. People will defriend you just because you hold a different opinion to them. That happened to me just last week when I announced I would be doing this show. Uh, somebody defriended me uh, just for doing that. Apparently, you don't go deep enough and your findings don't tally with this person's work. And therefore, I'm an enemy because I'm prepared to do shows with you when I really should know better. So defriending me will jolly well teach me a lesson. So I'll know better for next time. But this is what we're getting with this. It's, uh, you know, it's on a par with Flat Earth now. Are you finding the same? Yeah, it, it can be a very toxic environment, Mark. You know, my intent with all of this McCartney stuff is to just to present my research and my findings. I don't call it fact. Say, hey, here are my findings. This is what I've been looking at, and I will present it. And so what I've always said is if it resonates with you, fine. If it doesn't, fine. That's basically it. I'm not asking anybody to uh, to jump on board my ship without doing their own homework and without doing their own research. And yes, there are many different facets of the theory. There are uh, different viewpoints. And what I'm finding is if um, if I don't talk about somebody else's viewpoint or if they think I'm not considering it, then uh, you know, somehow I'm some kind of shill, some kind of agent. You know, Tom and I are working together. I work for Billy. These are all the things that I have heard over time and actually have seen typed out in uh, comments on uh, Paul is at Facebook pages and stuff like that. You know, none of that stuff is true. And, and, and just so we, the audience knows, I look at everything. So Mark and I, before we talk, started the recorder here, we talked about the twin theory. And I have looked into the twin theory and I've looked at other theories. It's just that I haven't found anything that substantiates it and backs it up to the point where I feel comfortable presenting it. And we'll get into more of a discussion about that, Mark, as to why, with regard to images and videos that have been doctored and altered over time. Sure. And one of the problems with this area of research is that it involves celebrities, of course. And whenever you get that, you get a lot of emotional and nostalgic attraction. And of course, you're going to get that with the Beatles. And everyone likes to be right. As usual, we're drowning in a tsunami of opinions. Everyone's got a goddamn opinion. My situation is that I'm in a constant state of flux on this, and I've been very clear about it. You know, there's certain aspects of my work where I'm very clear on what happened in a particular uh, area. But with this one, you know, <laughs> there's so many different aspects to it that I've been unable to come up with any kind of definitive solution. And I actually like it when researchers will state that they can't uh, definitively say what happened in a certain situation because new, new information is coming across their ra radar the whole time. That's the way it is with me. Uh, but the point is that none of us knows for definite the truth of this matter. The only way that you could is if you were a part of the Beatles in a circle way back in the day, going back to the 1960s, and that you were you know, inherently a part of whatever went on. And as we were also saying off air, there's probably no one or at best two or three individuals left in the world today that would have been a part of things that could tell you for definite what went on. So the rest of us are left with our informed opinions and our best guesses. But there's no way that any of us can state for certain that our view is correct, right? That's exactly right, Mark. And the only thing we can say or 
I can say that I think many Paul is Dead researchers will agree on is that the original Paul McCartney was swapped out and replaced back in the 1966 time frame. And so starting with Sgt. Pepper in 67, there was a new guy in the band. So I know that's a very, very base level in which to start with, but if we can all agree on that, those of us that are in the community, the Paul is Dead or the McCartney Conspiracy community, that would be a good start. It's from that point going forward where there becomes a lot of haziness and fogginess and there's a lot of theories out there that people are bantering around and throwing around. And that's what I think convolutes the whole thing. It makes it difficult to get a fix on something more solid beyond the replacement of Paul McCartney. As an example, how did it happen? Who was involved? What's the machinery behind it and all that? That becomes very elusive. Uh, some people don't want to talk about that stuff. They don't want to believe in that stuff. They want to discount it. Others will embrace it. So like I said, it just becomes uh, a, a bit messy beyond the replacement starting point. Sure. Another way of expressing it is to simply strip it down to the lowest common denominator and say there has been more than one Paul McCartney presented to the public over the years. I don't think anyone in this area of research could argue with that very simplistic way of putting it. There has been more than one Paul McCartney. So that's a statement that I stand behind. Just before we get into specifics, then you announced on a recent video that you're bowing out of this subject area pretty much, at least publicly after this interview because you really feel that you've taken it about as far as it can go now until there's something earth shattering that comes along to move the narrative along such as for instance the passing of Paul slash Billy do you want to just elaborate on your decision to take a back seat on this whole research right now yeah I never got into this Mark to make this uh, a forever thing and I got into it because I read the memoirs of Billy Shears going back about two and a half, three years ago. And when I read the book, it was a hard pill for me to swallow because uh, I was a huge Beatle freak. It's the, the Beatles are the basis of why I'm a musician, why I play guitar and why I write music and so on. And so when I read memoirs, it was a shock to me. There was a, uh, I wasn't apt to believe what was written in the book at face value. So what I did was I decided to go off and start to dissect it and see if I can debunk or validate, right, based upon my own research. So as time rolled on, I was able to validate virtually all of what was written in memoirs. And memoirs is an interesting book because you just cannot read it at a single layer. There's three layers to the book. But in any case, so I got to the point where I today feel very comfortable with what I believe actually happened, who the players are, what the motivations were, and so on. So since I've hit that point, I said, well, there's not really a whole lot more to do with this. Now, some people got, dis got very disappointed because they wrote me and said, oh, Mike, we really love the shows that you did and your presentations, and I really appreciate it. I really, really do. But the thing was, Mark, I, I didn't want to get into a position where I was going to continue to talk about something when there was really nothing new to talk about. I just didn't want to reiterate points that were already made or to find uh, one-off videos here and there to show more uh, situations where Billy's wearing latex. I mean, how many of those do you really need, right? So once you have four or five and you show it and you present it out to the public, the point is made. So that's the point I had reached. and. Um, there is no other reason other than that. Uh, I'm one of these people where I will research something and then I reach a point where it's uh, diminishing returns. And once I assess that that's where I'm at, that there's really nothing new to add, I will move on to something else, look into something else. As an example, right now I'm spending a lot of time looking into Aleister Crowley and looking into Thelema, looking into uh, researching Luciferianism because this is the basis of how our world operates and the backbone of the McCartney conspiracy. So I've shifted my gears into that now. So what my audience will see is more presentations that will have to do with, with that aspect. It won't be touching on McCartney or the Beatles. We'll be getting more into those areas as I try to explore it and explain it based upon my findings to my audience. That's why I did it. It's because I, 
I think at this point for me, it's played out. And as you said, if something noteworthy comes up, there is uh, some higher level of disclosure. I will jump back in the game. I'm not walking away from it. I'm keeping an ear to it, but I'm just not going to report on it on an ongoing basis. Sure. It's very easy for all this stuff to get viewed as entertainment uh, and people just wait for their latest fix, you know, the next video. And it's like the next episode of your favorite soap opera or something. And I don't think that's something you're particularly interested in. I'm not. I do what I do because I'm a truth researcher and I like stripping away lies and deception and shining a light on the truth of a situation. Uh, and I go where the information takes me. And I think you're pretty much the same. We don't do this for the entertainment value of it. That's exactly right. So I call it conspiratainment. Yeah. A lot of folks like conspiratainment. It's like right, watching a new episode of a TV show. And I don't do that, unfortunately, for a lot of folks. Uh, it's not why we're in the game. It's not why I do it. Exactly. So you learn what you need to learn. You apply it to your life. And then you move on. You move on to the next bit of research or seeking of knowledge and truth that you need to pursue. If you stay in one place, you stay static. You, I mean, you're not developing anything. You're not getting any smarter on anything. You're just kicking the ball around a field that has no net. And I have no desire to do that. Yeah. And probably like me, you don't even want to be presenting a lot of this information. Certainly, that's the way it is for me. You know, when I report on how satanic and how debased and how corrupted the entertainment industry is, I would prefer not to have to present that information because it's dark and it's devastating. But for as long as it's happening, I feel a responsibility and a commitment to put that information forward. But I wish it was some other way. There's no fun in this. No, there is no fun in it. And in my last video where I announced that I was sunsetting the, uh, the Paul is Dead work, I said the same thing, that the rabbit hole is dark. And so you cannot spend all of your time with your head stuck in that hole because it's not going to be good for you mentally, physically, emotionally. So you need to, like I said, get what you need to get out of it, understand it, and then move on because there's a whole other piece of life that has to do with spending time with your family and friends and experiencing the good stuff in life as well. It's not all about all this dark stuff. Uh, That's right. Right? You really need to enjoy your life as well. So, And I like to do that. That's another thing. You know, I'm a very private person. And another reason why I'm slowing down some of this stuff is because I have outside interests, Mark, you know, that friends, family, my, my practice and uh, those types of things that – I enjoy, and sometimes I enjoy those things a lot more than some of the topics I get into when I do research. Absolutely. And we're supposed to be able to enjoy life as well as, you know, face up to the commitments and responsibilities to truth that we have. That's a part of this life experience, but it's also all about enjoying the blessings of creation and all the good things in life. And we shouldn't feel guilty for that as long as we're discharging our responsibilities in other areas. Anyway, uh, before we move on, we do have to address the new edition of Memoirs, the 9 after 909 edition, which came out on the 9th of September 2018. 18, so there's the third nine. We've got 999 again. It's all about the numbers, as we well know. Uh, we've not done a show talking about this version of the book. So let's just uh, address some of the key aspects that came forward through it. I've read it, as you have. And overall, for me, in the tone of the thing, if we take Billy or, you know, Fall or Paul, whatever you want to call him, as being the author or the protagonist, for me, he comes across as slightly less aloof and arrogant as he did in the first volume and a little bit more personable. And then we've got some notes from Thomas U. Harriet, which take us to some fairly dark territory, some author's notes, which didn't appear in the first version of the book. Maybe you just want to give us your overall uh, take on what we got out of this book versus the previous version. Well, there is a lot more detail in this book. In the first edition, which was released on September 9, 2009, there was a lot of information. Some of that information was cryptic in a way that the reader had to piece things together in order to, to understand what was being told. In the second edition, which is the book that was released September 9th of 2018, the 999s, there's a lot more detail. And not only a lot more detail via Tom's 
footnotes, but also Billy gets into more detail. So some of the cryptic, kind of uh, ambiguous types of narratives have gone away. There's a lot more pinpointed discussion about what took place and why. Now, I should also mention, Mark, for the audience, uh, I'm going to share a conversation I had with Tom going back, I guess, um, it was a few months before the release, the second edition, September 9th of 2018 of Memoirs, the blue cover. Tom contacted me and uh, he said, Mike, I have been told that we have to revise the book, that they're speeding up disclosure. Tom said to me that he didn't know why that decision was made, so he was not brought in the loop as to why disclosure was being sped up. And so he had asked me, uh, what were the most common questions I was being asked by doing the presentations and talking about the topic that he could look to incorporate into the book so that instead of people guessing or wondering, they would get their answers. So the reason why I'm saying this is because some people were trying to figure out why a second edition was published and so on. It had nothing to do with competing with any other books. It had to do because Billy made a decision that he wanted to revise and come forth with more information, more detailed information, and be less cryptic. And so I gave Tom uh, four or five topics that I said to him that I thought that if you can put this into the book, this would be great. I had no foreknowledge of whether he uh, was going to incorporate my input, which he did. I was very happy to see that. A lot of it had to do with uh, with uh, Stanshall and uh, Ackrell and a couple of other things. The second edition, many people have asked me, hey, Mike, I read the red cover. That's the first edition. Should I read the blue cover, the second edition? And I said, look, if you're really into this conspiracy and you want to learn more, then yes, I highly recommend reading the blue book. Highly recommend it. Right. And among the, the uh, things we got from this version of the book that weren't addressed in the first one, as far as I recall, is the admission that Billy or Paul has been a victim of trauma-based mind control and satanic ritual abuse. There's one of Tom's footnotes where he yes, just yes. comes out and says this. And that's uh, quite dark and disturbing and shocking to read for the first time, isn't it? It was shocking. And also in the book, he mentions that uh, Billy was tutored by Alistair Crowley at the age of 10 to read backwards and be able to think in terms of reverse order. So we think about backmasking and stuff like that. This has to do with Crowley's tenets of his religion, Thelema. So when we, we factor in trauma-based mind control starting at the age of three, or at least that's Billy's earliest memory of being engaged in uh, trauma-based mind control programs and also being tutored by Crowley, we start to see a very, very interesting story developing. Now, in the book, it says that the trauma-based mind control that Billy went through was for the purpose of ensuring that his disciplines stayed in place. And what they mean by that is Billy was pinpointed from the very beginning because of his bloodlines to be something. So he was brought along. He was groomed. That's what the, the trauma-based mind control was about. It was to ensure that he stayed on top of his game so that he wouldn't have any soft spots in his desire, his motivation, and his commitment in the pursuit of his musical abilities, his skills, and ultimately his success. That's what it was used for. And the book mentions that some of the trauma-based mind control was not unpleasant, although there were unpleasant aspects of, of the program. And again, then we factor in the fact that he was definitely tied into Alistair Crowley, it makes a very, very interesting story. You've had Nick Shylack back on your show recently, who seems to be uh, postulating the idea that Billy is indeed an illegitimate son of Alistair Crowley. Do you personally place credibility in that idea? That's a tough one, because in the book, in the blue book, Billy certainly alludes to the fact that uh, it's possible, in my view. Now, we do know that he is linked to Crowley from an ancestry perspective because of bloodlines. In the book, he refers to William Wallace as the hardy warrior. And 
I was able to find on the internet through the help of uh, other researchers where it shows that the name Crowley goes back through the bloodline known as the Hardy Warrior. So Billy's telling us that he's connected into that bloodline, the Hardy Warrior, which is William Wallace. And then when we look at ancestry of the name Crowley, it goes back through the bloodline and the lineage of the Hardy Warrior. So I think it's well established that Billy, at the very least, is related to Alistair Crowley. Now, whether it is his father or not, that I don't know. I mean, that's still an, an open question. But one thing that we have to keep in mind is that, and Nick brought this up, is that Crowley was engaged in ritual sex magic. Now, if you go on Wikipedia, you're going to see that Crowley had, I think it was four children that are from marriages, if you will. Outside of those marriages and because of his sex magic, there's no telling how many offspring are out there that Crowley fathered. So it is possible that Billy is an illegitimate child of Crowley. It is very possible. But we don't know for sure. But I will say that he is bloodline related to Crowley. That part I feel very, very confident about. Sure. And uh, reading you Harriet's narrative in this new book, in many cases it reads like Conspiracy 101. It's like you Harriet's been paying major attention to all the hot potato subjects in the conspiracy world that guys like us talk about. So he covers secret societies. He covers occult symbolism. He covers social engineering think tanks like the Tavistock Institute. He covers control of the entertainment industry uh, and how artists are given roles to fulfill. He covers contracts and oaths of allegiance. He covers government sponsored mind control, etc. It's almost as if he's been swallowing a whole load of videos that uh, the likes of us would put out. And he's incorporated all this stuff into the book to make sure no stone is left unturned. Did you get that from it as well? Yeah, I looked at it as um, Tom weaving in these other conspiracies in order to validate, uh, maybe validate's not the right word, but to reinforce the message that Billy's putting forth. So as an example, in the first book, we didn't have all those footnotes. So Billy's telling us about the Illuminati and, and He's telling us about the Pyramid of Power, what I refer to as the Pyramid of Power, to 66 degrees within the pyramid and so on. But that's about it, right? So so I think Tom brought this other stuff in and explained it, and he weaved it into that Pyramid of Power. He weaved it into how the Illuminati have control over the whole nine yards, cradle to grave. They control all of this reality through that Pyramid of Power, right? The all-seeing eye. What Tom was doing, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Tom, but that was Tom and Billy's way of bringing the audience into the inner circle of the Illuminati, into the inner circle of the pyramid. He was essentially validating these conspiracies. He talked about the moon landings being fake. He talked about 9-11 being an inside job. And also when he talked about 9-11 being an inside job, Billy references that he was very disappointed with his relatives for being involved in the plotting of, of 9-11. Now, that was a very interesting thing that Billy said in the book because the person he was referring to was Barbara Bush. It has always been highly suspected that she was the offspring of Alistair Crowley. Right. Right. So I, I believe Tom brought these pieces in to further get the reader to understand the power and the influence of the overlords, of the Pyramid of Power, of the Illuminati. That's what I think he was doing. Because I believe in the Red Book, these pieces weren't in there, so it was kind of standalone. It's Billy telling you this stuff. He's telling you about the Illuminati. And some people could just shrug their shoulders. But in the Blue Book, he's tying it all together. He's trying to give you a bigger picture, end-to-end, -end, of how the Illuminati operate. It's not just Tavistock and the Beatles. It's everything. 
They control everything. They control your media. They control your government. They control your military. They control your medicine. They control your courts, everything. And I think that that's what uh, Tom and Billy uh, were attempting to do uh, by including that information in the book. Well, so there's a mind fuck for you. Uh, if Barbara Pierce, which was her maiden name, yes. and Billy were both offspring of Alistair Crowley, that would mean that Billy is a brother of Barbara, and therefore he's the brother-in-law of George Bush Sr. <laughs> and and the Bushes are all tied into the Windsors, the so-called royal family of Britain, through bloodlines. When you get into all the family trees, you find that all these families are connected into each other, and it's all very incestuous. And there he is taking a knighthood from the Queen. It's like, you know, keeping it in the extended family. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Mark, the influence of Alistair Crowley is pervasive. In the book, it, uh, it clearly states that the Illuminati, the vast majority of the Illuminati, subscribe to Crowley's Thelema. This is one of the reasons why I have made a decision to sunset continuing to dig into the McCartney conspiracy, because like I said before, I think I've gotten as far as I can, and I, I feel very comfortable that I know exactly what went on. And now I'm shifting my gears to understanding more about Crowley, Thelema, Luciferianism, Satanism. And the reason why is because this is clearly the philosophy and the ideology that runs the world. And if we're going to really be able to make change and understand how this reality works, then we need to understand what those that control, what they believe, what are their tenets, what are their doctrines. If we don't understand that, then we're just running blind. And I don't want to run blind. So that's a big reason why I'm making this shift. But the book clearly paints a picture of the Illuminati's belief system and their doctrines, which is Luciferian. And some claim that you Harriet is some kind of chancer or a fraud, and he's just put this book out, and it's all coming from his imagination. He's thrown all this conspiracy talk in there as a way of endearing himself to the conspiracy community. But is that actually possible? I mean, if you or I had decided to put out a book like Memoirs off our own back with no kind of affiliation, just as individual uh, guys, you know, uh, I would hazard a guess that by now we would either be in jail, in court up to our neck in lawsuits, or we would have had an accident uh, when we went out in our cars one day. Uh, yet uh, you, Harriet, doesn't seem to be up to his neck in lawsuits, uh, which does tend to suggest that these books are officially endorsed by the Beatles McCartney camp and that he is indeed doing the bidding of, you know, those institutions. Uh, and also we have the audio version of this book being voiced by Gregory Martin, the son of George Martin, the Beatles producer, which again underlines the idea that this is an approved product from the Beatles camp. So if you Harriet was just some random chancer with a very vivid imagination, would he really have got the cooperation of Gregory Martin? Exactly. So what we're seeing here is, first of all, this is not a figment of Tom's imagination. Tom is a real person. And what I should probably do uh, at this point, Mark, is explain how it works. But but you are, are exactly right. If this were fiction, Tom would have been sued by the McCartney camp. He would be sued by the Vivian Stanshall camp. He would have been sued by the Phil Ackrell camp. And none of this is taking place. In fact, he's got... A picture of Billy on the back cover, along with himself. Gregory Paul Martin doing the voiceover on the audio book. The other thing that folks need to understand is that there are tons of lyrics in the book. Not only Beatle lyrics, but lyrics from Rolling Stones songs, from The Who, and so on. An author cannot put lyrics in a book without getting permission to do that. And many artists will not allow their lyrics to be used in a book because they're not comfortable with the way the lyrics are going to be used. It could taint the song, it could taint the artist, and so on. So he had to receive permission to have those lyrics included in the book, So which means he had to have permission from the McCartney camp, Apple, he had to have permission from the Rolling Stones, he had to have permission from the Who. All the artists, Elton John, 
had to agree to allow Tom to have those lyrics incorporated into the book. Otherwise, there would have been a massive lawsuit for copyright infringement, period. Now, the way this works, so the audience understands, the Masonic structure, think of it as like a corporation, a pyramid, and think of how a corporation is structured. You've got your CEO at the very top, and then you've got all the layers down below. You've got your senior vice presidents, you have your vice presidents, you have your directors, you have your staff, and so on. Tom is a Freemason, and Tom received training, I'm assuming years ago, on how to encode, to do the encoding. Memoirs is encoded, right? We have the the acrostical code, that's the third layer. You have the bolded out letters, that's the second layer. And the first layer is just how you would read a book from you know left to right. So when Billy was, I should say, when Billy decided, or whoever helped him to decide that it was okay to start the disclosure process, disclosure teams were formed. Now, some of these teams were the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shears. That's one project, as an example. And there were other projects that are in place and ongoing as we speak that will have future deliverables. These include documentaries and films, those types of things. So when Billy decided that it was time to disclose, he then sent out the word that he needed to get the best resources on board to put the project teams together. Tom is, I'm going to, I'm not speaking on behalf of Tom. I'm telling you, I've explained to the audience how I uh, have figured out how this works. I have gotten some validation back from Tom. Tom can't say a whole lot because he has signed non-disclosures and confidentiality agreements. But think of Tom as the project lead for the memoirs of Billy Shears. He heads that piece of disclosure. And that's how it's going to work. So, so they're setting Bill up so that when he rides out into the sunset, which, and that process has already started, he's on his horse, he's riding toward the horizon. They're going to ensure that he rides out and there's going to be a lot of accolades. There's going to be a lot of thank yous and a debt of gratitude, if you will, by the Pyramid of Power, by the Illuminati, for all the work that he has done on their behalf and that the Beatles have done on behalf of the Illuminati, because it's the Beatles, and we'll get into this, one monstrous psychological operation from beginning to end. So that's how it works. Think of a corporate structure. They look for the best skills and resources within that structure to be able to work on these various projects. And Tom is heading up a project called The Memoirs of Billy Shears. That's the book version of Disclosure. So it's your feeling that the decision to disclose would have been a personal one of Billy's rather than him being instructed to do it? I believe that Billy has an agreement in place and uh, he's contractually obligated to do what he's doing. And then there's an expiration date in which in that contract or that agreement and who he contracted with in that agreement, maybe we can get into that a little bit, you know, but let's just say Let's just think of it in terms of a, a traditional contract. The terms say, at this point, this time, you can disclose. You can begin the disclosure process with complete disclosure, full disclosure, I'm being told, after he passes away. But between now and the time that he passes away, we are going to see a continued, ongoing rollout of disclosure. So Billy's contract, if you will, says, you can start the disclosure, which was in 2009, and continue putting information out, leaking it out. I mean, he's telling us, I mean, if, if people are paying attention, he's been telling us that he's not biological Paul since day one. But in the last 10 years, especially since I would say the last three years, the level of disclosure and what he's putting out there is, in my view, mind boggling. And it's even more mind boggling that People are not seeing it. <laughs> you know, it's in our face. Right. Well, this all clearly represents disclosure and revelation of the method, which are very important tenets within Freemasonry and other uh, occult mystery school teachings. And you, Harry, actually addresses this dynamic in the new book. 
as it plays out within Freemasonry. And it's acknowledging the universal dynamics of free will and consent, which are very, very key. So I just want to read an excerpt from the book here. This is from page 495 of the 9 after 909 edition of the Memoirs of Billy Shears. And so Tom U. Harriet says, with the Illuminati's doctrine of free agency, they have rules in place to obtain the consent of participants, lest some be esteemed as victims. The idea of mutual consent also comes into play with disclosure. Although the global, that's his word, elite accomplish their design by clandestine means, they tell all in words so plain that the majority disbelieves them. According to their law, when one gives notice of a course of action, if the recipient of the notice does not formally object to it, then he or she has legally agreed. With that tacit agreement, those who control the world do so according to the will of the people. Sometimes they lay the truth out so plainly that most people disbelieve it on the grounds that if it were true, the perpetrators would not admit it. However, with their idea of fair play and according to their doctrine of free agency, they must tell but are not required to convince anyone. That, this is me speaking now, that is key to why projects such as this go ahead. And he's laid it all out right there. That's exactly right. And that's one of the most telling parts of the book. And I'm glad you read that, Mark, because that is a glimpse into the level of detail that's contained in the updated version of Memoirs, the blue cover. You're getting information like this. This is very, very important information. You know, previous to this, many times we would have to guess and assume and connect the dots to come to that conclusion. Here, we are being told by Billy, via Tom, of how this works. Now, Bill is in the illuminated degrees. I'm thoroughly convinced of this. In fact, in the book, one of the footnotes says that Billy is the Illuminati, meaning he is in the Illuminati, the Illuminated Degrees. Very, very important. So you're, we're getting information from somebody who is in that inner circle. Now, what you just read reminds me of a quote that is attributed to Confucius, which says, signs and symbols rule the world, not words nor laws. And so what, what they do, okay, is you have to understand the signs and symbols. Once you begin to understand the signs and symbols, then you begin to understand reality. You begin to understand how it's constructed. You begin to understand how it all works. So if you're only going to pay attention to what people say, words, or you're going to obey laws, then you're going to stay in the land of the profane. And I know there are people out there that do not like when I use that word, but that is how they view the masses. A quote that came to me from a Freemason goes like this. There are those that possess the key for knowledge, and there are those that do not possess that key. Very black and white. This is how they view the masses. This is how they view the world. There are people that possess the key for knowledge, and there are people that do not. And a lot of people don't like that because they don't like the binary nature of that view. But it doesn't matter how you feel about it. These people are running the world. This is how they see it. This is how they approach it. This is how they, they roll out their agenda. And it goes hand in hand with the quote I just read, signs and symbols rule the world. This is why I keep telling folks, You've got to understand more about the esoteric. You have to understand more about mysticism. You have to understand more about Crowley, Thelema, Luciferianism, Satanism. You've got to understand it if you truly want to understand how this all works. Because this is the philosophy. This is the ideology. These are the tenets and doctrines that your overlords work with. This is how they go about their business. So if you're not going to understand how they go about their business, then again, you're, you're flying blind. And the way these controllers see it is that if only a few of us are able to see or acknowledge what they're communicating, that's neither here nor there for them. As far as they're concerned, they've stuck to their tenet of giving us the opportunity to know if we have the eyes to see. So right. you've got to want to know. 
And a case in point would be these books, the memoirs books. Now, these have not been really heralded from the rooftops in any major way there's been no marketing campaign behind them to get them in bookshops all over the world there's been no promotional campaign to uh, get them talked about on chat shows and things like that you've got to go searching for these books you've got to know they're available and go out and look for them and be prepared to pay the money to obtain them but as they see it, they've still given you the opportunity to know they are there for those who are prepared to invest that time and that resource and that care. And that's what it comes down to. You've got to want to know. You've got to go seeking. It's not going to get dropped in your lap. You've got to go and look for the truth. Perfect, Mark. That's exactly how it works. If you are truly seeking knowledge and seeking the truth, then you will find books like this. If you're not seeking truth and seeking knowledge, then you're not going to find books like this. It's not going to exist. It's not going to be in your awareness. So it was perfectly said the way you said it. it is uh, you have to go seek it out. And, you know, once you start seeking, you, you'll be amazed at what it is that you find. That's right. It's free will again, isn't it? You know, you're expressing your free will to desire to know by going out and seeking this information. So nobody's forcing you to look at it. You're choosing to address it. And uh, if you make that decision, there's nothing they can do about it. You're expressing your free will in creation uh, and you're not being coerced or manipulated in any way. You're just, uh, you know, exercising that decision. So I used to be of the view that we are going to get full disclosure once Billy passes in that we're going to be blatantly told through the mainstream media that, oh, my God. We've just discovered that this guy wasn't actually Paul McCartney after all. It seems that he was an imposter that's been playing the role for all these decades. We've just discovered. Documentation has just come to light. Nobody knew. This is incredible. But that dynamic would, of course, involve Billy's kids having some very awkward questions to answer. Uh, and also Ringo and Yoko, if they're still around at the time. And uh, presumably, if it can be shown or if it was shown that uh, this guy wasn't actually Paul McCartney, Billy's kids would be required to give up all the wealth that's been accumulated through the fraud of that family claiming that they're, you know, of Paul McCartney. So maybe that's something we're not going to get in that blatant a form. But. On the other hand, it could be argued that full disclosure has already taken place because, as you were just saying there, we've had so many clues and hints and pointers to tell us that Paul McCartney, or to go back to my original statement, there's been more than one Paul McCartney, that how much more really does anyone who's paying attention need? That's the key to it, isn't it? Paying attention and, again, the desire to know. But it could well be argued that we've had full disclosure now. And really, there's nothing more that needs to be said to convince anyone with an open mind of what they're really looking at here. That's right, Mark. So it comes down to how awake are you? And so, yes, you and I and many others who follow this work, we already know that biological Paul McCartney has been gone for 53 years and that Billy and others have been playing the part ever since. I don't need full disclosure. I don't need somebody to get up in front of a camera and say, oh, by the way, the guy that you thought was uh, biological Paul McCartney from Liverpool, well, you know, he hasn't been in the, you know, in the picture for, let's just say, 60 years by the time they decide or if they decide to do full disclosure. I don't need that. You don't need that. And and by the way, you know, so I don't think they will probably make an announcement like that. I, I think what will probably happen is uh, they're going to continue to roll it out, paying homage and tribute to uh, to Billy's work. Uh, with more overt clues, that's how they're going to do it, I believe. I mean, I mean they, they may turn around at some point, many years from now, you and I will be very old, and it'll come out and say that there was this guy, William Shepard or William Campbell or Billy Shears playing the part and so on. But the approach here clearly is to address those who are awake and those who are awake know. We don't need a news flash. We already know. Right. And you've got to wonder if Heather's gagging order is going to expire upon Billy's passing or whether she's going to feel a bit freer or be uh, able to reveal what was in that box of evidence that she spoke about. That could be an interesting twist to the story, couldn't it? 
It could be, although I probably have a different view on the whole Heather Mills situation, Mark. I, I believe that um, Heather floated that stuff out there as a way to apply leverage in the divorce proceedings so that she can get what she needs to get out of the settlement. Uh, it's not to say that she doesn't have a box of stuff, right? I believe that Heather wanted out of that marriage, and uh, this was uh, a big lever that she had, was to float this whole thing out there about, hey, this guy is not who you think he is. And if I recall, he didn't have a prenup, which is unbelievable. And so he had to negotiate with her. He had to come to the table because there was no prenup in place. And uh, so she walked out with a ton of money. And I do not think that Heather Mills is going to say anything because I'm not even sure that she's really interested in saying anything. I, I tend to believe that she, the marriage wasn't working. She wanted out. She got out. She got a ton of money. And that's it. End of discussion. I don't think we're going to hear a peep out of her. It's just interesting to me that in Britain, we get to find out about all these sirs and lords having been grotesque pedophiles only after they pass away. So that was the situation with Jimmy Savile. Uh, we got reports about Sir Edward Heath, the former British Prime Minister, uh, apparently being a child killer. Uh, we've had it about, you know, Sir Clement Freud being a paedophile and Lord Greville Janner, Lord McAlpine, Sir Cyril Smith. Uh, and these revelations only ever come forward after these people have passed away. So uh, it's just interesting to reflect that we do tend to get information when people are no longer able to uh, answer for it. So it's just a, an aspect of the dynamic there. Just to throw a little miscellaneous loose end in, as we mentioned, the memoirs books tell us that the real name of the guy playing the role of Paul McCartney is William Shepard, William Wallace Shepard. But another name that has constantly come up in this conspiracy research is William Campbell. Uh, so people tend to flip between these two names, William Shepard and William Campbell. Now, there is a William Campbell who was a part of the group Marmalade, and he's known as Junior Campbell. That's his nickname, but his real name was William. And Marmalade, of course, were a group that were affiliated with the Beatles. The song Oblady Oblada was written for them. I think McCartney actually wrote that song and the Beatles recorded it. And there was the song Junior's Farm as well, a Wings song. Uh, so that becomes quite interesting. This guy, William Junior Campbell. Do you think there's anything in that in terms of where this name William Campbell came from? Or could this be a coincidence or a dead end? I am leaning toward uh, Campbell being the uh, surname on his mother's side of the house. So I believe that Billy has gone by, well, he's telling us his name is Billy Shepard. By the way, he tells us that Wallace is not his real middle name in the book, but that's a clue in order for us to draw the lines back to William Wallace, the bloodline. Okay, So I believe it's very possible that he has used William Campbell. He's using William Shepard now, Billy Shears, Percy Thrillington, and a bunch of other names that he's used over time. He used Billy Martin as uh, an alias when he was doing his first solo album after he dissolved the Beatles. And by the way, it was Billy that dissolved the Beatles. It wasn't anybody else. Billy decided, you know, the time was up. He was Apollo C. Vermouth as well. Yes. He used a lot of aliases, and this, this is who he is. You know, we have to understand that Billy's an entertainer, and Billy will play different roles, and uh, he'll take on different names to play these roles. Vivian Stanshaw is another one. Phil Ackrell is another. And I still get people that want to debate me about this. And maybe we could talk about it at some time during the show. We can get into it. And I'll explain how that entire piece of it worked. People will send me uh, pictures and say, oh, look, he's got a, a, a Campbell Tartan on. And he's wearing that. So therefore, his last name must be Campbell. Uh, but I've also seen Billy wear Scottish Tartans. So I do believe what he does is he swaps off between his uh, father's surname and his, his mother's surname. That's just something that I'm weighing in on right now and I'm kind of leaning towards. So, but I've always said, uh, Mark, that his last name, I never really got into much debate over that because I was more interested in the bigger picture. So I didn't want to argue, you know, to doomsday when the cows come home, whether it's Campbell or Shepard and I always said to folks, it doesn't matter. It could be Jones. It could be Smith. 
let's understand the bigger picture first. Let's understand how this thing happened, how it worked, how it went down. And then when we have time, we can then have a discussion about his, his last name. You know, we have to rise up above the weeds so that we can see the bigger picture of what's going on. Sure. I mentioned in the week on my Facebook page that I paid an early morning pre-dawn visit to 57 Wimpole Street, London, which was the home of the Ashers, Dr. Richard Asher, uh, who was a doctor concerned with hypnotherapy and research into LSD and mind control uh, techniques, if uh, reports are correct. And he had his daughter, Jane, who was Paul McCartney's girlfriend for a period in the 60s, and Peter Asher, the son, who was one half of Peter and Gordon, the musical duo. And he was also a director of the Indica Gallery in London. And if walls could talk, there would certainly be a story or two to be had from 57 Wimpole Street, I'm sure. Uh, so we're assuming that it was the real bio biological Paul that lived there during the 60s. Uh, and... We can't rule out the suggestion that he may have been a mind control subject of Dr. Asher, because as well as being his home, this was where he based his medical practice. And this brings a whole new element to the story. Uh, we get all these uh, accounts of Paul apparently composing his music in the basement room in which Dr. Asher was discovered dead in 1969 in some very mysterious circumstances and apparently Paul wrote many of his most famous songs in that house including Yesterday uh, but it's got the spectre of mind control looming all over it this one as far as I'm concerned. I agree with you 100% Mark so I'm, I'm going to say something here that's going to probably shock a lot of people <laughs> not you but there are folks that are listening to this I believe biological Paul McCartney was in a mind control program. And I believe biological Paul McCartney, along with John Lennon, were in mind control programs from an early age. And the reason why I say that is because if, and I'll focus on McCartney, and I'll touch on Lennon a little bit because this is more about uh, Paul. But if you take a look at his growing up, uh, his mother was the main breadwinner, right? She was the one that was bringing the money into the house. When you take a look at what his father what his job was and his role and, and so on, it seems very suspicious to me, very suspect. So if you go on Wikipedia and you take a look at Jim McCartney and you're trying to get a fix on like, who was this guy? What did he do for a living? I mean, you, you kind of walk away empty handed. Something about, you know, he, he was a, an amateur musician and uh, he was an inspector at an engineering plant at some point. But other than that, you don't get a whole lot about this guy. And of course, biological Paul's mother passed away when he was 14 years old. Fast forward, he's connected into the Ashers, and I agree with you 100%. I do believe, based upon the research, that the Ashers were involved in some level of, of mind control. Jane Asher's mother was uh, uh, George Martin's music teacher. I mean, how weird is that? And then we also see research that connects Jane Asher's father to Stephen Ward. Yes. Right? And, and Stephen Ward, uh, you know, he was uh, into some really, really dark stuff as far as, uh, you know, the uh, the deep state goes. He was into uh, sex trafficking and, uh, and organizing orgies, and he was uh, heavily involved in the Profumo affair. And then, you know, this discussion where because of Stephen Ward's what he was involved in societally within the ruling elite, that Brian Epstein was attached to him or connected into him in order to, quote unquote, uh, hawk the Beatles or sell the Beatles uh, through Stephen Ward's contacts and so on. So we're starting to get a picture here that is a little seedy, in my opinion. And so when I take a look at Paul McCartney and I take a look at his childhood, his mother dying at 14, we really can't get a fix on his father. He's connected into the Ashers. It seems Jane Asher's father was involved in psychiatry and possibly into mind control. We're being told that Paul McCartney received the song yesterday through his dreams. And, you know, it just kind of starts to formulate a, a picture that I think we have to take a step back on and say, OK, well, there's more to this, I think, than what we're being told. Yeah. I heard the suggestion from one researcher, I forget which one it was because I look at so many of these videos, but somebody was suggesting that 
Paul may have been subliminally fed yesterday while he was in that house, given given that uh, Jane Asher's mother was a music teacher. She taught oboe and piano to George Martin. Uh, and this person was speculating on whether it's possible that Paul may be in some kind of hypnosis induced state absorbed this music and believed that he had come up with it himself he spoke of having you know got the inspiration in a dream and so he put the song together and this person was asking well maybe yesterday was given to paul so that he really believed he'd come up with the song but in fact it was gifted to him to you know just help the beatles get celebrated as these great musical icons and to get that song out there in the public consciousness yeah and and if we take it further if we if you read the words in yesterday, the lyrics, and you lay it up against the whole McCartney conspiracy, it's his eulogy. Yeah. And then that song was then recorded by hundreds of other artists. It's probably the most famous song of all time recorded from the, the pop music perspective, from that genre, right? So you've got Lennon with Imagine and you've got McCartney with Yesterday, their most famous songs. Yeah, yeah. And Imagine, by the way, is all about the New World Order, right? So that's yeah. that's what John was infatuated with the with the New World Order and the uh It's communism, right? Yeah, it's it's communism. It's it's the you know, it's the one world. That's what John was singing about. And everybody loved the song, oh isn't it beautiful? And you know, it's a great song, don't get me wrong, but what I'm saying here is we 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 have to try to put this stuff into context. The Beatles, Mark, were a psychological operation from beginning to end. There was no organic. Again, I know a lot of folks really get upset with me when I say this. So when we talk about Paul McCartney possibly being in a mind control program, in fact, I was told he was in a mind control program from a source that came to me. I vetted the source, wound up in my December 2018 presentation, The Beatles, Paul McCarty, and The Grand Illusion. That source told me he had first-hand discussions back in the 1990s at a very high-level meeting, which included people from the deep state, including intelligence organizations, technology companies, and so on. And there was a person there that was explaining that McCartney was in a mind control program, and that his mind control programming was breaking down. And that led to, in part, to his demise. It's, it's not the whole reason why he was taken out. The reason why he was taken out was because it was a pre-planned ritual sacrifice. Maybe we could talk about that. But the point they're trying to make was this source came back and said that he was indeed in a mind control program. And so so when we get songs like Yesterday, then we get songs like Imagine, these songs have meaning. In other words, they are intended to to influence society and the culture. They're there to to insert social engineering, right? That's what they're there to do. And if, not just those two songs. I mean, it's, the Beatles had a whole portfolio of songs, and it's not just the Beatles. It's, it's all these bands that are promoted and have tremendous success within the pyramid of power. The question has been raised many times of whether guys that were as young as the Beatles were when they first came out really could have been expected to write songs as complex as the ones that were put out with some very mature lyrics. And, you know, these guys were so young. I think George was still 18 when the Beatles broke through. And, you know, Lennon, the eldest one, was only 20. Uh, and yet these songs, are they just show incredible worldliness and, and knowledge of life. And, you know, could guys so young really have been penning songs like this is a question you often get. Well, that's a great question, that, and that's a question that I get also, and, an, and another question that I uh, addressed in my December 2018 presentation. It, you know, uh, there's a, a theory out there that Theodore Adorno of the Frankfurt School was responsible for writing uh, most of those songs. Now, I don't know whether Theodore Adorno was writing those songs, but I, I come from this from this perspective. I believe it's very possible that the Beatles did not write all of their songs. I'm not saying the Beatles didn't write their own songs. I'm saying that there were songs that they didn't write. Some of them, yeah. That, yeah, that were credited to them, right? Lennon and McCartney. And for songs that they did write, I also believe it's very possible that they received a lot of help from experts to shape those songs and to ensure that they were structurally sound 
as far as uh, being released for pop music consumption. So in other words, Biological Paul or John Lennon would have come into the studio. They would have shown George Martin, who I think was huge. George Martin was a handler in uh, playing that role of shaping and massaging the songs and ensuring that they were ready for prime time. But I'm, I'm convinced that there were others, uncredited, people we will not know that were also in that inner circle doing the same thing. So if Biological Paul or John Lennon came in with a song, these folks would say, you know what? Good start. You've got the uh, a good start for a, a good song here. Now, it needs a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You need to fix the bridge, adjust the lyrics on the verse here. I've got to make the chorus a little catchier. That type of work, okay? Now, this, this goes on This goes on all the time in the, in the music world, right? This is not new. We're given a story, and it's a story that says that the Beatles, you know, they were infallible as far as their songwriting went, and they just turned these things out. I don't know. I've gotten to the point where it's like, I do not believe that. Plus the number of songs that they wrote over the span of, you know, from 1963 through 1969, that's a lot of songs. A tremendous amount of songs to be written by essentially two people that did other things other than sit around and write songs. Right. Hanging out in India and such. Exactly. So, um, and again, we're, we're going to get a lot of thumbs down for saying this uh, when we post these videos. But again, I'm not saying that the Beatles didn't write their own music. I'm saying that there's, in all likelihood, there is or there are songs that they didn't write, they took credit for. Right? Tavistock said here, put Lennon McCartney, slap it on here. Like the song For No One, that's uh, a McCartney song. That is a very, very mature song, lyrically, from somebody who would have only been, what, 23, 24 years old? Right. How does a person of that age have that worldly view of a relationship? How does that happen? Eleanor Rigby, we mentioned yesterday. We can go down the line on these songs. And then there's the timing of some of these some of these songs coming out, such as Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, LSD, right? On Sgt. Pepper coming out in the summer of 67, when LSD was everywhere and the counterculture was in full effect. Very convenient timing. Now, Lennon may well have written that, uh, but maybe he was asked to write a song that ties in with that whole zeitgeist. Uh, you know, it's, it's possible that he was uh, instructed to put it out at that time. Yeah. Now, now that's you're leading down a great path here because, yes, it's very possible. John wrote I Am The Wallace. He, he wrote the lyrics, right, that he didn't get any help with it. Lucy in the Sky, the same thing. Here's the thing that people have to understand. John and Paul, and George, and Ringo, but I'm going to focus on Paul and John specifically, were trained in the esoteric. They were trained in the mysteries, in mysticism. So the story that we get about John being a cut up in school and all this, I mean, this is just a story. What was John really doing? How was he really being trained? So these lyrics, when you break them down, they're occulted. They have hidden meanings. They are layered. They were experts in layering music. Layering means at the first layer, you will see the lyrics or sing a song, and it means something at right at that very, very top level, the veneer. Underneath, there's a deeper meaning, and the Beatles were all trained in this. So like in memoirs, there's a picture that Billy puts in the book that John Lennon drew that had to do with the Four Horsemen. And that picture in memoirs is completely occulted. It's immersed in occultism. How did John have that knowledge? I mean, was it because he was a cut up in school or was he formally trained to understand these concepts? Mike, did you ever see Joe Atwill's breakdown of the lyrics of I Am The Walrus and what's really being communicated there? A long time ago. Yes, I have. Yep. He put out a great article on his post-Flaviana blog. I'll try and find it and put the link to it in the show notes. But uh, he's basically saying that I am the walrus, although it appears nonsensical and just gibberish and LSD-induced hallucinations or whatever, in fact, betrays a very deep knowledge of tenets of Freemasonry. And there's references to the Boer War in South Africa and all kinds of other things encoded into that song. It's a very fascinating breakdown. And he's speculating on whether 
someone of Lenin's uh, life experience could have written a song as complex and as layered and as coded as that without some kind of assistance. Well, that's the thing. So here, let me just say this. All of the Beatles were Freemasons. All of them. All were Masons. They all received their MBEs. Ringo was knighted. Billy was knighted. And if George and um, Paul had survived, they would have been knighted as well. So they're all Freemasons. And probably Stu Sutcliffe Stuart, as well, right? Well, we, we, you know, we know we've, uh, we've seen pictures of Stuart going back into the early 1960s making uh, Masonic hand gestures yeah. and symbols, right? What do we think he's doing there? Here's the thing, Mark. When we go back and take a look at the stories we are given about their childhood, we have to understand the same people that created the Beatles, Tavistock, created the narrative. They put the stories out. So what you're reading on Wikipedia or what you're reading in some book is a story. You have no idea whether it's true or not. You assume it's true because you're saying, well, so-and-so wrote a book and, you know, why would he not put truth in the book? Well, the person who wrote the book may think it's true as well because they're going back to source material and speaking to people who are in the inner circle, who are there for the sole purpose of putting the fiction out there, the storyline out there. What was John Lennon really doing? What was he really being taught during his, his childhood? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. I'm not saying I have the answer, but I have a pretty good guess because based upon my research and my work, all of these guys are Masons, all of them. So they were receiving Masonic uh, degrees. They were receiving training, uh, understandings into the esoteric, into Freemasonry. This whole thing where, you know, the Beatles were just these four working class Liverpool lads that just hit the big time because this guy who owned a small record store named Brian Epstein discovered them. And then they were they were declined by Decca Records. I think the Decca Records story is, is nonsense. I don't think that ever took place. The Beatles were always earmarked for EMI. EMI is a part of the of the machinery. Yeah, the military industrial complex. Exactly. Exactly. And so there's a reason why they ended up with George Martin as an example. It becomes very interesting to reflect on what happened with Pete Best. So he was kicked out to make way for Ringo back in August 62. I wonder if that could be because Pete Best was not part of the Brotherhood and they wanted one of their guys in there. And something interesting I found out the other day, uh, which apparently is uh, true, Pete Best had a brother or a half brother known as Rogue Best, who was fathered by Neil Aspinall, close confidant and uh, roadie for the Beatles. Uh, Neil Aspinall, when he was very young, evidently lived in Pete Best's uh, household and impregnated his mother, who was uh, some years his senior. And the result was a child who turned out to be Pete Best's half brother. So Pete Best is still alive, by the way. And boy, yeah. I bet he's got a story or two to tell but he probably never will. Yeah, that's a theory I floated out there that Pete wasn't in the Brotherhood so that uh, when it came time to throw the switch and make the Beatles what they ultimately became, Pete had to be pushed out. The other thing that could have happened was that Pete is in the Brotherhood, but he was at a lower degree. And so they had to bring somebody in that was at least at the, the degree of Freemasonry that the other Beatles were at, right? Because the way Freemasonry works, you have the degrees and you are only allowed to know what you're allowed to know at a specific degree. You have no knowledge of the degrees above you. So if the other Beatles were of a higher degree in masonry than Pete Best, then Pete would not have been a good fit. So they would have had to move him out and bring Ringo in. And Pete, Pete's kept it zipped for over 50 years. Yeah, yeah. Pete's kept it zipped, I'm sure, because uh, Pete is probably in the Brotherhood. OK, even though I said I floated it out that, that perhaps he's not. But the other thing was, even if he's not in the Brotherhood, Pete may have received some compensation. We'll put it that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Heather style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've just looked up Dr. Stephen Ward, who we were talking about earlier. Now, his home and his medical practice was 17 Wimpole Mews. And I passed this the other morning on the way to Wimpole Street. It's a two minute walk away. It's just round the corner from 57 Wimpole Street, where the Ashers lived. And both those guys, Dr. Richard Asher and Dr. Stephen Ward, are both said to have committed suicide. Go figure. Yeah, 
That's right. That's right. So like I said, Mark, there's a whole piece of this story that we're not told. So we're fed fiction. That's what we're fed. Or we are fed a story with big chunks of the truth missing. Yeah, it's, it's tantalizing to reflect on there being a depository of information stashed somewhere, which documents this whole affair, because, uh, you know, is this story really just going to be within the memories of those that were involved? And once they've all died off, there goes the story and there goes any possible opportunity to verify all this. Or is there going to be documentation somewhere which details how all this was done? And isn't it amazing to think that that might be lying in a vault somewhere waiting to be discovered at some point in time, maybe? Well, there is documentation. So I'm going to I'll reveal this and uh, hopefully uh, I don't get Tom in any hot water. But OK, so the way Tom received information to write the book is he received boxes of information. Right? So he was sent files to be able to to write the book. So my understanding of the way it worked is the book wasn't written by Tom sitting in a room with Billy and, and Billy dictating verbally, this is how it needs to be written or this is how it went down and so on. Right. What happened was Tom received documentation, a lot of documentation. And I'm assuming that the documentation was uh, categorized right down to the nth degree. This means that Billy's life has been completely documented from beginning to end. So the point I'm making here is there is documented, very detailed documentation of what went on, who the players were, whether they're still around or not. The other thing we should probably mention or I should mention is that all the people behind the whole replacement, the planning of it, the strategy of it, the implementation of it, they're all dead. They're not alive anymore. Billy's the only one. Billy's the only one basically left. Of course, there are people that are involved that have picked up where those that began. Well, you've got the likes of the likes of Ringo are presumably going to be privy to what went on and Yoko. Yes, you got you have those, but I'm not speaking about them. They, they're basically the they're on the periphery, right? They're the players on the stage. I'm talking about the people that actually in Tavistock, in the deep state, in intelligence that plan this thing, strategize it going way, way back, way before the Beatles ever got started. We're talking about Billy right now, right? right? And then planning this whole thing. They're all gone. That's why those who are in the Paul is Dead community who believe that they're striving toward some kind of justice for biological Paul, that somehow they're going to bring some lawsuit and people are going to be arrested and so on. It's not going to happen. No one left to it's arrest. It's not going to happen. There's nobody to arrest. They're all gone. And even if there were people around to arrest, the pyramid controls the courts. The pyramid controls law enforcement. So you're not going to touch these people. Even if they were alive, you're never going to touch them. I mean, let's take a look as an example, two quick examples here. We have had people looking into the JFK assassination now for 60 years. What justice has been brought to John F. Kennedy? Right? People are still talking about the single bullet theory and Lee Harvey Oswald and so on, even though anybody with a half a brain knows that it was a massive conspiracy. Nobody went to jail. Let's talk about 9-11. Anybody, again, with half a brain knows it was an inside job. As far as I know, George Bush is still walking around a free man. Donald Rumsfeld is still walking around. Dick Cheney's still walking around. There's no justice. So you're not going to get justice because, unfortunately, to the dismay of many people, this whole thing, beginning to end, cradle to grave, was a well-planned, well-executed psychological operation. And biological Paul McCartney was a part of that psychological operation. He was one of the cogs in the wheel. And that this is how it's going to play out, Mark. It's what we were saying before. People will, people who are really focused and looking for truth already have the answer. They already know. Right. And part of that knowing is, is that you're not going to bring down the deep state. Not going to happen. 
It's interesting that an American writer in Tom U. Harriet was commissioned for these books rather than a British one. And I wonder if that was a deliberate choice to keep some distance between uh, Britain and all this investment that we have here in the Beatles and, you know, Billy himself being based here and somebody over in the States putting all this stuff out. What do you think about that? I don't know. I don't know why uh, they, they chose an American. I do know that they chose Tom because of, uh, and I'm sure there's others that have the same skills as Tom within the, the Masonic corporate structure, uh, because of his uh, his skills that have to do with encoding. A very specialized skill. Perhaps it came down to um, they probably had a number of names that they could choose, and they decided to go with Tom. Maybe they felt that uh, he was uh, the best of the, the names that they had in the hat to pick from, or perhaps uh, it's one of these situations where Billy had to uh, interview and be comfortable with the person that he was going to work with. Because I had mentioned that the information that went into memoirs came via boxes that Tom received that were categorized and all this, but also I'm, um, I'm, I'm fairly sure that Tom has had direct email conversations back and forth with Bill to answer questions that might have come up as Tom was putting the book together. So that's how I think it probably worked. I think it came down to who they felt was the best candidate, and Tom just happened to be an American. Sure. Big shout to Bill. Big shout to Tom, by the way, because you know they're listening, right? Hey, fellas. Yeah. yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> Page 326 of memoirs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and there has been so much of McCartney in the media of late his controllers are really getting their money's worth out of him at this late stage in the game, it seems. You know, he brought his new album out. He's been on tour recently. He did the carpool karaoke with James Corden. He's done uh, X number of interviews with different publications. And now we've got the upcoming movie, Yesterday, going back to that song that we referenced just a short while ago. The cast for this movie and the people involved reads like a who's who of establishment assets and lovies. So it's going to be directed by Danny Boyle, who uh, actually turned down a knighthood in 2012, surprisingly. But he did direct the 2012 London Olympics Occult Ritual Sigil Fest. Uh, it's been written by Richard Curtis, who's uh, an OBE, I believe. He's the husband of Emma Freud, who is the daughter of the aforementioned Sir Clement Freud, who was dis disgraced posthumously when it was revealed that he had, in fact, been a paedophile a few years ago. Uh, so Richard Curtis is in it up to his neck. It stars Ed Sheeran, who's got connections into the royal family and the United Nations through his father. It's got James Corden, the aforementioned, who's an OBE. He stars in it. And uh, just to read the synopsis of it briefly, Jack Malik is a struggling musician. During a worldwide blackout, he's hit by a bus. After awakening and discovering that he's the only person in the world who appears to remember the Beatles, Jack plagiarizes their songs and becomes a star. So yesterday is all through this film. And again, it strikes me that this is a vehicle that could not have got out there without the official endorsement of the Beatles McCartney camp. You could not make a movie about that song and about Lennon McCartney songs generally without having the full approval of, of that camp, I would suggest. No, that's right. That's right. It's um, I saw the trailer for that, and I thought to myself, this is another clue for us all. Yeah. And uh, think about what the movie's saying. It's it's saying there's a different reality, and uh, yeah. in that reality, we have somebody who is filling a role. It's not the role that they created, but they're going to pick up where the other person left off. And now in this case, in the movie, it's going to be a band called the Beatles. So the, this person is going to pick up where the Beatles left off, at least in his mind. And he's going to, in this altered reality, this different reality, he's going to capitalize on the Beatle music and the Beatle success. So when we take a look at the premise of the movie, we can easily apply that to Bill's situation. Bill picked up where biological Paul left off and then took the Beatles into a different reality. The old reality was a reality of love songs and the such. And then the new reality, which we can take a look at as even the Sgt. Pepper Band, into a, a world of psychedelics, 
into a world of where they're changing the culture and they're changing the societal norms. So those are the parallels that, that I saw there. And uh, I'm actually, I'm looking forward to seeing the movie because, you know, knowing what I know, it's going to be uh, very interesting to dissect it, Mark. Yeah, I mean, being a Richard Curtis movie, it's going to be very sickening and schmaltzy and saccharine because his movies always are. So it's going to be straight research for me. But I, I will yeah. I will see it because I want to you know, know what's being said. Uh, but in that movie, in the uh, plot line, you've got this idea that familiar songs were not necessarily written by the people you thought they were. That's another aspect of the narrative that's running there. And they've exactly. they've selected this song yesterday. It's hammering home and reinforcing in the public mindset the idea that yesterday is one of the greatest songs ever written, like any further reinforcement was needed of that. And it's also hammering home the idea that Paul McCartney is just this awesome, great guy, and he always has been. And, of course, the general public's going to lap this up because they've been told to. And it's one of these feel good mainstream blockbuster films. And it strikes me that you get output such as this for the profane masses who buy the official version of everything and never think to look into things any further. So they get yesterday, whereas the likes of memoirs and the Winged Beetle series and the I Am A Phony stuff on YouTube are a bit more for the initiated, those that are able to think for themselves and are willing to put in a bit of time and effort and discernment into the truth-seeking process. So they fob the masses off with this kind of movie, and the rest of us have some more uh, interesting stuff to sink our teeth into. That's right. That's right. It goes back to what we were saying before. If the will is there. Signs and symbols rule the world, right? They're, they're telling you. They're communicating it to you. And it's not just with the McCarty conspiracy, but they're communicating to you and trying to reveal the, the true nature of what's going on in the reality through movies and television and all of that, through the media. But if you're not awake enough or astute enough to understand what it is that's being shown to you, then you're going to be misled. You know, you're going to wind up in places and, and doing things that, uh, in all likelihood, you'd rather not be. Sure. Like I said, I'm going to do what you're going to do with that movie, Mark, is I'm going to watch it and, and basically just take it in and look for the signs and symbols and the, uh, the, the true meaning of what it is that uh, they're trying to tell us. Yeah. Somebody sent me an interview that McCartney did in 2017 in Australia just recently. He was in Melbourne for one of his gigs uh, because, you know, 70 odd year old guys love going to Australia on tour uh, rather than resting up at home. Right. <laughs> so th this interviewer is, is talking to him about uh, his songs. And I think they're talking about yesterday, actually, again. And McCartney says, uh, yeah, I, I can't believe this was written by a 24 year old kid who happens to be me. He adds. So he starts off saying, uh, I can't believe this was just some 24 year old kid that wrote this. And then he thinks to add, which just happens to be me. So it's almost as if there, there was a clue there that he's kind of for the profane masses just clarified that he is actually talking about himself on that one. Well, Billy drops clues all the time. And I have said, and again, I catch a lot of flack for this. Billy has been telling us since day one that he's not Paul. And I was like everybody else. I didn't pay attention to the clues. I didn't pay attention to the signs and symbols, if you will. And eventually I woke up to it. And when I did wake up to it, Mark, and when I go back and I take a look at like the, just the monstrosity, the overwhelming number of clues that were put out there, not just during the Beatle years. I had somebody write me and say, oh, the, you know, the, the clues stopped after he left the Beatles. I'm like, no, they didn't. He's still leaving clues, and he has been ever since uh, his, the first day in which he went solo. He was dropping clues, and he still is today. We did that one video, Mark, was very, very telling. Uh, I forgot the name of the song, but you remember the one where there's all this blatant Illuminati? The song from his new album. Yeah, yeah. He's wearing his black and white suit. He's got the monarch butterfly on his shoulder, I mean, on his lapel. It's unbelievable. And, you know, you and I and others who or into this research, we see what it is he's telling us. And what's amazing to me is, it, it flaws me, is other people will watch that video, and maybe I'll, I'll link it here so that people, I forgot Is that the, the one called Who Cares? Is that the one? Yes, Who, Who Cares, cares? Yeah. that's the one. Blatant, blatant Illuminati symbolism. And there are people who will watch that and they do not get it. They don't understand what Billy's telling us. 
Well, he starts out portraying himself as some kind of hypnotherapist, like a, a practitioner, you know, which could be a nod back to Dr. Asher. Who knows? And he's got this practice, you know, and this this woman comes to visit him and he says something like, oh, sorry, it's a bit chaotic here. You know, it's all chaos. Uh, but, you know, it's quite orderly, really, or, or words to that effect, which brings in the Ordo Ab Chao slogan, of the right. New World Order. Uh, and then you've got all these spinning spirals everywhere, which are blatant mind control triggers. And the whole thing is just a sigil fest. And there's even a little nod to the Paul is dead uh, conventional theory of Paul being killed in a car crash where he's taken off in this open top sports car. Right. That's right. And like I said, he has the monarch butterfly on his uh, on his jacket. And if you read memoirs, you and I have, we know that that is a connection back to his trauma-based mind control program. Yeah. Right? So he's making all these links. But the thing is, in order for you to understand and connect the dots, you have to pay attention. You, you, have, to, you have to drop the idol worship. And, and Billy's been doing this, by the way, right? So Billy is engaged in an alchemical process, which means that in order to build the new, you have to destroy the old. This is why when, you know, recently he's had some uh, some news out there where he was saying that um, he and John Lennon masturbated together. Right. And charming story. Exactly. Right. You would think to yourself, why are we coming out with that story? Who cares about that stuff? We don't need to know that, Bill. But also he came out with a story saying that he goes to gay bars. Uh, another story that came out in which he said that he wrote the song In My Life, which is a song, a John Lennon song, right? So you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Why is he coming out with all this stuff? Is it because he's he's losing it as he gets older? No. What he's doing is he's tearing down the facade, moving the curtain aside. He's telling you, look, for all of you who are worshiping the Beatles and you think the Beatles are this, for those of you who are believing the myth, the story, I'm going to continue to push stuff in front of you that hopefully will make you understand you need to stop the idol worship. Well, one thing is his recall for dates and times and detail is really bad. So he can never seem to remember what year a song came out, what album a song was on. I've seen him in many interviews where the interviewer knows the answer to the song. And he'll say, you know, uh, tell me about the circumstances in which this song was written. And, you know, he can't remember at what point in the Beatles timeline the song came in. And he often says, oh, ask the fans. The fans know better than me, which is a bit of a cop out. There was one question and answer session he was doing where somebody asked uh, when what period this particular wings jacket came from. There was a jacket that he wore on, on a wings tour. And he said, oh, I don't know, sometime in the 1970s, I think. You know, you don't say, mate. <laughs> You've just na narrowed it down to 10 years. So he can't remember what specific year these things happened. And it's probably because he's got so much stuff to remember, to hold in his mind, that he can't possibly formulate it into any kind of timeline. Well, also, Billy admits in memoirs to making stories up. That's the other thing right. that we have to uh, keep in mind here. So when he talks about, as an example, going back to his childhood or the early Beatle days when he wasn't there, and he gets asked a question, he was schooled to a, a large degree on history, uh, Biopol's history and the Beatle history, you know, which he, he probably knew because he was running in those inner circles back then. Um, he was connected into the Beatles before uh, he took over the band in 1966, late 66. But he makes stories up. So, And what he found out was that nobody was paying attention to details. So when somebody asked him a question that he didn't know the answer to or he couldn't recall what he was told, he would just make it up. Yeah, right there on the spot. Right there on the spot. And then the person who was uh, interviewing him or writing a, a paper or an article or whatever just took it and ran with it. They would it. think, oh, shit, I never knew that about the Beatles. Wow, I've just learned something there. <laughs> yes, yes. In fact, there's one author, I forgot, oh, I can't remember his name, but he had said that uh, McCartney uh, engages in revisionist history. That was very insightful because he was absolutely right. That's exactly what he does. So not remembering specific dates and stuff like that doesn't surprise me, Mark, circling back to what you were saying, because he's probably made so much stuff up yeah. over the years. He won't remember he what he himself He can't remember what said. it is he made up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so. All right. Well, I think we're reaching the end of the conversation, Mike. Is there anything we've not covered that you particularly wanted to get in there at this point? 
Well, there's just one thing I, I just wanted to cover real, real quickly, and I won't go into great detail because I'm going to do a presentation on it. But a lot of people who are into Paul is Dead, they really get stuck on the whole Stanshall piece. And so let me just explain real quickly how that worked. In my uh, December presentation, I said that uh, the way they did it for the McCartney character is they had two primary replacements. They had a street Paul and they had a performer musician Paul. The performer musician Paul is Billy. Street Paul is an actor that was out there for public consumption. So this is a person that you would see out in the streets. They would be doing interviews and stuff like that. But this person wasn't a musician, so they weren't writing songs. Billy was writing the songs. Street Paul, as far as his transition to look like biological Paul McCartney, was well underway. It was ahead of Bill's. So Bill had to play catch up. But they didn't worry about it. I'm going to say they. I mean Tavistock and those involved because they knew they had Street Paul covering the bases on the outside. And Billy was, you know, within the confines of people who knew what were going on. So he didn't have to look like Paul McCartney in the studio, although the transition, the surgeries, the fillers, and the latex were underway. Okay, so you had two. You had two primary replacements. And then there were other players that paged in and out. So there weren't just two of them, as Mark mentioned earlier. There were many doubles, but there were two primary, Street Paul and Musician Paul, with others strewn in that were photographed, videoed. That's why it's so difficult to tell who's who. Now, the reason why I set it up that way is because the same exact template was used for Stanshall and for Acryl. So I have people who write me all the time and they say, oh, look at Vivian Stanshall in this video here. This can't be him. He was married to Kai Longfellow. He had children and so on. It's true. But the person who was married to Kai Longfellow and had children wasn't Bill. That was a street version of Stanshall. So what Billy did was he had two Stanshalls. He had the performer Stanshall, which was himself, who played with the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innes. And then there was an actor slash musician who played the role of Stanshall. So when Billy had to play McCartney, the two can coexist. The Stanshall that passed away in 1995, that was street Vivian Stanshall, street Viv. Do you buy that that individual actually died in a real house fire? Or could we be looking at the retirement of a public persona? Because this is quite a sinister element of the new memoirs where, uh, you know, the author, the protagonist admits to the fact that this guy was playing the role of Stanshaw. And he says that when Linda got cancer and he wanted to nurse her in her final years, he didn't want to play the role of Stanshaw anymore. And he offered this guy who'd been playing the role some money to relinquish the role and the guy didn't want to and the next thing you know he dies in a house fire so either uh, we're looking at a very sinister dark twist to the story here uh, and people can you know understand the implication involved or uh, the public persona was retired rather than anyone actually dying what do you think about that yeah that's a good question so in the book it says that billy approached the actor who was playing the uh, the lifetime actor of vivian stanshall Street Viv and said, Hey, look, I'm going to retire this thing. So, um, I'm going to give you a bunch of money and you can go back to your original name, your, you know, in your life and so on. And, uh, and that's going to be that, right? And so the way the story goes in the book, it, that person, Street Viv, declined the offer. And, you know, on March 5th, 1995, he dies in an electrical fire. Yeah. What are the odds of that happening randomly? As opposed, as opposed to him being knocked off. That's what we're saying here. Right. So it's possible that he was paid off and he went back into his, his life before Vivian Stanshaw and he's still around and it ended that way or he did die in a fire, right? Now, if he died in a fire, yes, the way it reads in the book, it looks sinister. It's like, oh, you declined my offer, did you? Yeah. Well, that's not going to work well. Exactly. And then if... You know, and then if we break down March 5th, 1995, the numbers are 66. You see, March 5th, March 5, 3 times 5 is 15, 5 plus 1 is 6. 1995, in numerology, the nines become zeros. So 1995, 1 and 5 is 6, it's 66. So it looks like something took place there that is a bit dark. I don't know how to answer the question, but it could be possible that he took a paycheck 
took a severance and he went home. For those that want to argue this whole thing about Stancho, let me just say this because I know we're running short on time here. You must differentiate between somebody's legal name and their birth name. Okay, there's a big difference. So when people want to argue with me that that's Vivian Stanchel and they're pointing to Street Viv, you need to do some digging. And when they tell me that their family is chuckling, that, you know, the memoirs is saying that uh, Bill played uh, Vivian Stanchel, yes, because Billy did not play who they know as Vivian Stanchel. There were two Vivian Stanchels. And the question to ask anybody who is on the inner circle of the whole Vivian Stanchel discussion is to ask him this question. The person that you believe is Vivian Stanchel, is that their birth name or is it their legal name? The birth name is a name you are born with. A legal name is a name that identifies a legal fiction. Right. That's how Billy gets away with Paul McCartney, right? Paul McCartney is his legal name. It's a corporate fiction. Sure. It's not his birth name. And to basically wrap this up, the same template, performer, acryl, street acryl, same template, except in this case, the Phil Acryl bit was passed on to a guy by the name of Philip Ralston. Philip Ralston. Billy was looking to lease that character to Philip Ralston and then pick up some, if you will, royalties, money, if you will, if the Phil Ackrell character took off. It never did. That was the issue. It never did. So it's a very simple, straightforward template that they use. Two of everyone. <laughs> two of everyone at the minimum. For Stanshaw, there was two for sure, but there were others also. Because Billy says that even during performances sometimes uh, with the Bonzo Dog Band, they had a, uh, somebody fill in because... He couldn't make it. And usually those performances involved masks and stuff like that. So it wasn't Billy behind the mask. It was somebody else. And then the same thing with uh, with Phil Ackrell. I get sent videos saying, look, that's Phil Ackrell. He's playing uh, at some venue in the 1980s or the 1990s. You're crazy, Mike. That's Phil Ackrell there. You're saying that Billy played him. You're not looking at Phil Ackrell. Phil Ackrell is a character. You're looking at somebody playing the character or the part of Phil Ackrell. That's what you're looking at. And again, Mark, I will do a complete presentation on this. I will break it down to the nth degree, and that, that will be it. For those that have eyes to see, ears to hear, they will get it. For those that want to continue to stay in denial and refuse to see what it is that, you know, is right in front of you, then that's your call. You know, I don't, I don't concern myself one way or another, like I said in the beginning of the show. I put my research and findings out, you know. No dog in the race. Yep. All right. Well, we shouldn't need to do another one of these shows until Paul slash Bill passes now, theoretically. Uh, that should be the next time that we need to come together and do another one of these, because uh, I think it's all been done now as far as it possibly can be until some major new revelations come along. So we'll kind of bear that in mind. But I think you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. <laughs> well, I'm going to stay plugged in. I'm, I'm just not going to be digging in the way it used to, Mark. For my subscribers and people who listen, you know, some of them were dismayed by the fact that I was stepping out of it. But, you know, I'll have one foot in, but I'm just not going to be in it all the time. I just have other things that I find to be of more interest and uh, are better for me from a personal development perspective. Yeah, you don't want Here Lies That PID Guy on your gravestone. Uh, uh, I think that's probably too late. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is. Now, uh, do you just want to remind people where they can go for the rest of your work and to find out all the other stuff that you put out? Yeah, just go to my hub website, sageofquay.com. And uh, if you go there, type in that URL, uh, you'll find everything. You'll find my blog. You'll find my uh, YouTube channels, uh, my guitar repair channel, everything. Everything's there. Mixcloud, Spreaker. It's all there. All right. And I've got a video to a talk that I did in London alongside Nick Collistrom back in February about the McCartney conspiracy. By the time this show gets out, it will probably be back on my YouTube channel. I did post it the other day, but it got taken down with the usual copyright bollocks. Uh, and I think that's probably down to the fact that it included the video to Strawberry Fields Forever with the audio. And I think that was probably picked up by YouTube's algorithms and automatically blocked. So I need to do an edit of the video and remove that part and then re-upload it. So that's going to be on YouTube.com slash Mark Devlin TV. Uh, so you can find out what Nick and I had to say about that. 
Yeah, don't use the video, Mark. Don't use video. Use the stills from the video. You'll get away with that. Apple and UMG, they jump all over that stuff. Sure, yeah. I've got the audio to the song. There's also an excerpt from a video that was taken from the Beatles Anthology DVD. I don't know if they're going to block that as well. It's the one where Paul walks in on George and he says, Hello, William. I'm just wondering if that's going to get blocked too. Maybe I should remove that. I have it in mind and it did not get blocked. Okay, maybe it's just music then. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so you can take a shot. I have it. It didn't get blocked. Not yet. So it's not to say at some point it won't catch up with me, but so far, so good. Okay, Mike, thanks for coming on today, brother. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. This is just for I'm picking up vibration. I'm picking up vibration. I'm picking up vibration. I'm picking up vibration.